drunk poets see God too. Drunk God sees poet. Gratitude. Gratitude. Thank you, everybody, who has ever taken part in Drunk Poets See God at Bar Gary Gary, as performer, audience, or both. You've created a wonderful, inspiring, life-affirming phenomenon. Especially, of course, I thank Sam Bennett and Saucer Chisholm for giving birth to Drunk Poets See God and nurturing this baby with such welcoming warmth and fun. Thank you to Tommy for making the space that is Bar Gary Gary and for keeping poets drunk or sober as each needs. Thanks to Robert Moreau for introducing me to Drunk Poets See God and thanks to all the friends I've made here, especially Giselle, Laurie and Sean. And when I say I thank you to everybody who has ever taken part in Drunk Poets See God. I include the woman who came here just once and read a poem off her smartphone that detailed all her many virtues, including modesty, bravery, intelligence, and her belief in fairness, justice, equality, and standing up for her own rights. When I left, Drunk Poets See God that evening, I saw her on the platform of Ikinoe train station and I said, Hi, I saw you at Drunk Poets See God, your first visit, right? How was it? It was great. It went really well. Good. How did you feel about reading? She said, That's what I meant. It was great. It went really well. Oh, nice. You see, she said, I do a lot of public speaking. At that moment, the train came and we got on and she walked far away from where I stood. And that was lucky for her because just then, right there, somebody started shouting in a really loud voice. GET YOUR FUCKING PENCIL OUT NOW! Yes, it was God. And as usual, God was drunk. What now? I said, on the train? Yes, now! I've had an inspiration! I'm gonna dictate it to you! There's nothing to write on. Use your fucking face, piss poets. Now get fucking scribbling. Title is The Power of Public Speaking. It goes like this. Writing. It goes like this. Don't write that part, you numbskull. So God dictated and I wrote on my face. And I swear to you that every other person on that train was pretending they couldn't hear a single word. The story God dictated was in fact true and about me. Here it is. The power of public speaking. I do a lot of public speaking especially in supermarkets. I was cautioned by the police <laughs> and referred to a pain clinic in December. Tell me, the doctor said, how much do you want to be hurt? Break my heart, I said. She said, I hate you and I always have. I said, is this covered by national health insurance? I was pained but not cured and I spent Christmas and New Year quietly, alone and practicing my public speaking. After the winter break, I was looking forward to chatting with my colleagues at work. But when I got into the teacher's room, the conversation was so inane, I had to go outside and walk around in a circle for three minutes. <laughs> When I came back in, somebody was saying, yes, it was that senior staff member who forced me to reapply for the same job I've been doing for three years. That colleague who is less qualified and less experienced than me, but more inane. 
she was saying, Korean people have longer legs than Japanese. I think it was me that shouted, we should fucking cut them off. And that put an end to the inane conversation. This is the power of public speaking. And I am grateful to God for that story. When I got home, after being dictated to by God, I went to bed, and before sleeping, like most of you, I guess, I wrote a question to ask my dreams. It was, in the world and in my life, who is the person I owe the most gratitude? In my dream, I was asleep, and when I woke up, there was something hard in my pajama trousers. <laughs> So I took it out and found it was a metal number one. Where did that come from? Who do I have to thank for that? In my dream, I went on a journey to find the person who gave me the number one. I walked along a dark corridor with black curtains. And as I was stumbling along, I bumped into a big person. Who are you? I said. He said. Do you remember the dark night coming home in the team van for the volleyball club for delinquents? You were a member and 16 years old, with the van being driven by Father Peter and you sitting in the back, leaning on the back doors as we rattled along the highway. And when we went over a bump, the doors flew open. And as you were falling out, I grabbed you like a little volleyball. I said, Sean McBride, I do remember. And is it you I have to thank for this number one? No, he said. I saved your life, but I didn't give you the number one. So I walked further along the corridor with the black curtains until I bumped into a busy person. Who are you? I said. She said, do you remember that time in Sri Lanka? What time? Early in the morning, a beautiful day, December 26. You were getting in the sea to go snorkeling and the water was rising strangely over the top of the jetty. And you said, why is that? And I came out of the hotel room behind and grabbed you and shouted, run! And we ran to the lighthouse and watched the waves. There were 206 foreign tourists in that town. And of the six who didn't die that day, we were two, you and I. I said, my wife, I do remember. And is it you who gave me this number one? No, I saved your life, but I didn't give you the number one. So I walked through the dark corridor until I bumped into an elbowy guy. Who are you? I said. Shine your torch, he said. My torch was a mirror. And I saw a skinny guy wearing a bobble hat. Did you give me this number one? I am the one, he said. How can I thank you? Hold my hand and let's pray together. I'll teach you the words. I am the one, wherever I go, wherever you find me, I am the one, never more, never less, now and always, I am the one. Without purpose, with purpose, attached, unattached, in any case, now and always, I am one. Thank you, I said. And thank you, everybody.